Hey everyone, I'm Brendan Shulman, former Vice President of Policy at DJI, and I'm excited to be on the Pixel Drone Show. We're going to talk about the history and background of Remote ID, as well as the new court decision that is going to impact everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Greg from Pilot Institute. We train drone pilots all over the country. Hi, my name is Haya from Drone Excel, where we cover all the drone news on our website. Welcome to the latest episode of the Pixel Drone Show, our weekly podcast where we talk to industry professionals about what they do in the UAS space. From professionals who use drone to fly inspection missions to public safety users, or even drone light shows, you will learn on the Pixel Drone Show that drones are much more than just toys. Hey, what's going on, Haya? Hey, man, how are you today? Good, good. Do you have a good weekend? I had a pretty good weekend. Yeah, it's uh, it's been really hot last week here in New York, but it's uh, it's cooled off a little bit. We had some rain, so uh, that was good for sure. That's always a good thing. We had actually rain pretty much all day yesterday, which is pretty rare for us. We actually had a whole week of rain, which is uh, we had Vic here, uh, Vic Moss from the DSPA. Um, yeah. came here to record a course last week, so we did quite a bit of stuff, but we were going to go fly and do stuff and actually it rained all week, which <laughs> of all weeks for him to be here is that, that one week that we get rain. And, I was going to uh, say, it doesn't yeah. rain much typically in, uh, in Arizona, does it? No, I was looking at my data. I have a little weather station and we had, up until last week, we had seven days of rain all year, all, all, of, all of 2022. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's seven days. And it's, yeah, we get uh, and it, we get quite a bit more here in New York. It's uh, it's not as bad as in the Netherlands where you get tons and tons of rain, but uh, in New York we still get uh, get quite a bit. So, yep. Um, did you guys have a good week with uh, with Vic being over there? Yeah, that was awesome. We did uh, quite a bit of recording with recording for the the photography and the videography course that we have. So he's the uh, he's going to be one of the guest instructor uh, along with Ken and Billy. Yeah. And uh, so adding more content, it's pretty exciting. And then and then of yeah. course on Friday, the uh, the big uh, bombshell drop from yeah. the uh, U.S. Court of Appeal, right? And we're going to be talking about this today with our guest. Yeah. Who do you want to tell us who our guest is? Yeah, sure. Let's. Uh, we have Brendan Schulman uh, on the show today. He used to work for for DJI as the uh, VP of, of of Policy and Government Affairs. Uh, he now is in a similar role at uh, Boston Dynamics, the company you might know from uh, the robots in Boston, of course. Um, we're having him on the show because, uh, regardless of the fact that he doesn't work for DJI anymore, he's still a drone expert and a drone policy expert, and he knows a lot about remote ID. He's been uh, very much involved and. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to talking to him uh, about Remote ID, about the lawsuit that has been kicked out of court now, uh, and what Remote ID uh, holds for us going forward. Yeah, he um, he's it's actually it's actually cool to have him as a I'm going to call him as a civilian on the show as yeah. someone who's not li tied to uh, any companies in the UAS space. And uh, we're not really going to talk about his Boston Dynamic thing because we, we really want to have him today just talking about what yeah. he thinks about this. He's uh, he's obviously an attorney uh, as a background and and he's been involved with Remote ID for for a long time. And I'm sure he still keeps track of everything that happens. So uh, it's yeah. the, I, I read I spent my weekend reading the, the the 40 page document and it's it's only 40 pages pages but there's a lot of implications in that document that the u.s course of a court of appeal released and then we'll be talking obviously about this today and uh, we actually have a live event right after i'm done with this this is monday morning it's actually uh it's actually not even nine o'clock yet here and we have two events back to back uh one is going to be a live event right after this with kenji and um and scott stuffman from uh auvsi yep. where we're going to be talking about kind of the uh, the whole RDQ lawsuit and what the implications are for for the industry. So it's uh, it's a big topic at the moment. Remote idea it is today. So uh, let's bring him in and let's get started with the show. Then that sounds good. Awesome. Well, well, uh, welcome, Brendan. Welcome to the show. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with Remote ID that uh, that we would love to talk uh, about with you. But I think before we dive into the more current uh, parts of Remote ID, maybe we can backtrack a little bit and kind of get everybody up to speed as to uh, what Remote ID for Drones exactly is and how it came about. And um, I can't really think of anybody better than you to kind of take us on that journey. So uh, <laughs> please go ahead. <laughs> great. Thank you. It's It's great to be back on the show. Um, as I mentioned to you, obviously, I, I'm happy to share my opinions here. Remote ID is something I care about. 
a lot. I worked on it for years, but you know, I, I no longer work for DJI, uh, and my current employer doesn't do drones. So this is just my personal opinion and impression of everything. Um, awesome. So yeah, dr- look, remote ID. Uh, you know, th- the easiest way to think about it is it's a license plate for drones, right? So. Uh, there are lots of drones being used already. There'll be more drones being used in the future. And I, I think if, if you're a drone user, I think you intuitively know that um, drones do raise some legitimate concerns about aviation safety and and security and nuisance. You know, we've had drones that have disrupted sporting events and uh, allegedly have flown near airports. Some of those are probably real and some aren't. Uh, and, you know, just like we have an accountability mechanism for your car, which is a simple license plate, Remote ID is a license plate for drones so that when a drone is doing something it shouldn't, there can be some way to figure out who owns that drone and then ultimately investigate uh, who the pilot was and either warn that person or um, take enforcement action if warranted. And also it, it enables the um, authorities to figure out where is that drone pilot standing who's controlling the drone, which is important to try to deal with an imminent type of threat. For example, at a sporting event where you really need to get the drone down, it doesn't belong there. Uh, You're not gonna be able to do that unless you find the pilot. Um, So that's another important um, mechanism of remote ID. So you were part of the aviation ruling committee when this regulation was kind of being drafted. Is that right? Well, in 2017, there was an aviation rulemaking committee that, that there, I think there were like 60 people on it. It's advisory only. So its job is to talk about the issues and figure out what could be recommended to the FAA in terms of how to do remote ID. That was the charter of the ARC back then. So we, that group didn't draft the rules, but it provided a set of recommendations, some technical, some policy on how the FAA might proceed with remote ID. And that's an important distinction because we're having the same thing now with an ARC. There's a, an aviation, uh, I'm sorry, the BV loss ARC, uh, where they made recommendation and the FAA is looking at these right now, but it's not final ruling. So um, what did the FAA really take from, or what did the FAA discard from the, the, the things that you guys had mentioned in that report, in that aviation ruling committee report? Yeah, there've actually been quite a few ARCs uh, over the years. The first one was registration. I was on that one. Then there was the so-called micro ARC, which was about flight over people, which led to the new rules that are out on how to fly over people in the different categories. Uh, and then remote ID and yes, BV loss. Um, so in the, in the case of the t- 2017 remote ID ARC, um, it was actually a fairly contentious process. There were a lot of different stakeholders there who wanted different things. Um, and you could tell that in the, in the way that kind of like the final voting came out. Um, but there was also a lot of good consensus building on, um, what is the general recommendation to the FAA? And and the general recommendation was, um, for, uh, remote ID to apply, uh, to almost all drones out there. So there was, you know, maybe a weight cutoff, which is what the FAA eventually picked. Uh, but also that there are two main technical ways to do remote ID. And again, think about it. If you're trying to do a license plate for drones, um, you're not going to be able to read it. Drones are small and they're very far or high uh, up in the air. So you need to make it electronic, right? And the only way to make something electronically transmitted is is through radio signals, right? Either uh, a broadcast locally, uh, like a walkie-talkie kind of thing, uh, or broadcast or connect to the internet through the cellular phone system uh, into some kind of internet remote ID database. So the ARC basically said, uh, do it either way. It, the, really the primary, and in my view, the, the cheaper and easier way to do it was broadcast. And the report does say that, but it says, or FA, you could, you could instead um, do it via the network system of, of connected uh, computers and connected drones over the internet. Now, in terms of what the FA, <laughs> so, so then what was interesting is when the FA proposal came out, uh, it was it was shocking um, because it it proposed that the rule was going to require both a broadcast and a network connection, and the network connection would be handled by service suppliers that were contemplated to charge a subscription. Um, now a lot of people objected to that. I was one of them, both personally and on behalf of DJI, because of the cost 
And interestingly, in light of the case, I think we'll talk about later because of the privacy invasion of requiring everyone to connect to databases and send their flight information to private companies that would store it. So it could be searched later by FAA or law enforcement. Um, so the FAA did not, uh, at least initially accept the recommendations of, of the ARC and instead said, do everything, <laughs> do everything possible. Uh, and by the way, also don't allow the drone to even take off unless it is confirmed to be connected to the system. So I, I would call that like a dra draconian um, outcome. Yeah. Uh, but yep. uh, thanks yep. to the 53,000 comments that were filed um, from, I, I believe many of your viewers and, and myself and others, um, the rule changed before it was finalized uh, to, to being broadcast only, which from my perspective was, was a huge improvement. Still not exactly what the ARC recommended, but far better than the um, original proposal. So the um, and I agree with that a hundred percent. The in in the ARC recommendation, I think there was a distinction between certain types of operation that would require also having the network connection. So more advanced, more complicated uh, um, uh, activities would require that. Do you still think that's a viable option that we that we might see in the future, where network remote ID would be for maybe Amazon or other large drones that are doing doing other things? So there wasn't much justification in that original proposal for why the FAA was saying you have to do both, but there were a few indications saying that this would facilitate a traffic management system for beyond visual line of sight operations. And that honestly, that's not a surprising reason because in the industry, people have been talking for a long time about the need to network the drones and do traffic management, but that's not remote ID, right? That's a different goal. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, the, that um, that goal still exists for the broader industry. I think a lot of people believe that you'll need to connect all the aircraft in order to provide collision avoidance technology. Uh, if you go back a few years, there's a white paper um, that DJI put out that I wrote that says, well, actually, you probably can do BVOS using onboard avoidance technologies if you just have the drones uh, detecting everything around them and communicating vehicle to vehicle, um, that the whole connectivity back to a system that manages the traffic may not be necessary, at least in um, uh, less congested areas as a sort of uh, way to start BV loss operations. Um, but at the moment, you know, given the outcome for remote ID um, being broadcast only, I, I do think broadcast remote ID can uh, enable traffic management because that provides in one way information on, on those drones into whatever receiver is within range. Uh, so you could um, use that as a method for enabling traffic management, but um, that's sort of not really the goal of remote ID. Yeah. So going back to uh, remote ID in the FAA, I mean, a lot of people think that uh, remote ID is purely pushed by the FAA, but there are other government organizations or departments that are behind the FAA pushing for remote ID as well, correct? Yeah, well, again, this is going back a few years in terms of the point in time where this got started. First of all, Congress in 2016 said, FA, take a look at remote ID, figure out the standards, and then put in place appropriate regulations. So, it, you know, the starting point for this was Congress. But of course, mm -hmm. Congress was influenced by the security agencies in Washington who were saying drones are a growing problem. We need to identify them and we need to be able to discriminate between friend and foe. Um, so, you know, Congress didn't just wake up one day and think of remote ID. It was obviously encouraged by the security stakeholders. And then it became very clear, both at the beginning of that ARC process in 2017 and in various other discussions in Washington around that time, that this was being driven mostly by the security folks uh, who were going, I don't want to say crazy, but were, were very concerned about the growing threat of drones to um, secure locations and even just, you know, the public at, at sporting events and airports, you know, the, the Gatwick <laughs> incident, whatever that was, uh, d you know, that was later, but that kind of just confirmed that there was a security issue uh, in the minds yeah. of government officials. And so it, it was largely driven by security, but FAA is a safety or, uh, agency whose um, mandate is safety. So you got a little bit of a mixed purpose here, right? You have a safety agency implementing a policy that is largely driven by the security community. 
Yeah, and it's not entirely crazy, right? I mean, this is all happening in the days that drones are taking off, literally, like more and more people are flying drones. You had those big media things like uh, uh, Gatwick, you have uh, Syria, where we see uh, off-the-shelf drones being used and modified to drop uh, explosives. So it's not entirely unreasonable, I guess, for people to be nervous about drones and, and what people might be doing with them. No, I, I when I said crazy, I meant that was their, they were, their mental state was, this is a problem. Not, not that the fears were crazy. I, I, th there are legitimate risks and concerns that, that this community should not dismiss about drones flying around out there. Now we can debate which solutions make sense. Is it a hundred percent solution? No, of course not. Um, but uh, the risks are real. You know, it's both safety and security risks exist. And I, I think if you're a, a conscientious drone enthusiast like I am, you would say, yeah, it makes sense that that uh, drones should be um, accountable, pilots flying drones should be accountable when things go wrong or when people do things that they that, that are reckless or, or worse. Yeah, I'm 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 kind of torn on this because I've I've commented on this during the remote ID and PRM process and and said that you know a uh, remote ID as a tool to prevent national security threats is not necessarily the best tool because what information are you getting? If I think of myself as being on the ground as a as a law enforcement officer or or whatever, all I can see is really like you said that, that license plate in the sky. All I can see is a number. Uh, I don't even have technically access to that data because the FA has has access to the name of the pilot. The drone doesn't tell you I'm a good drone or I'm a bad drone. The drone just tells you I'm flying here and here's my location. So uh, I'm, the, the only thing I would say is, yeah, if the drone does not have remote ID, then maybe you think it might be more of a threat and you can take it down quicker. But, um, you know, it, it, to me, there, there's, there's never been really a true solution as to how is this going to help anyone on the ground figure out that this is a threat. Do you have any insights on that? Well, it's a building block. You know, you got you got to start somewhere, and I, I think the the issue is that today, all drone flights are basically anonymous, right? Unless the drone crashes and you have your hands on it and read the registration number, um, you have no idea who is flying the drone that you know flies over the, the baseball stadium. Okay, so that's kind of like a unacceptable starting point from a security perspective. Uh, now, I think if you're talking about how, you know, how do you get permission to fly over a very sensitive location? The answer is not just remote ID, right? There will need to be layers of security that would uh, authorize that kind of operation. And, and I know in the, <laughs> back then we were talking about secure forms of remote ID. And I think there are even companies out there that are working on and advertising a more secure form of remote ID than the basics. But I think you got to think about this as a basic starting point, you know, like a, like a car license plate, right? Like, you can take off your license plate and go drive. You can alter the license plate and pe people who do that, right? They, <laughs> you can paint paint it. You can steal someone else's plate. So like that's not a perfect system either, but most the overwhelming number of people are honest in using license plates and it does help in a variety of situations, you know, speeding and hit and run and, and things like that. A, a committed criminal is going to evade license plate and is probably also going to evade drone remote ID. But that's like the next step of the solution. Uh, and it's probably a counter UAS solution rather than, than a remote ID solution. Yep, I agree. Yeah. So now with remote ID, we have two important dates coming up. The first one is September 16 this year, and then we have September 16, uh, 2023. Can you explain to us why these dates are important and what they signify? Right, so in the final FA rule on remote ID, um, September 16th, 2022 was set as the date for manufacturers to comply with remote ID requirements, which is to say if they offer for sale on the market in the United States, a drone above 250 grams, it needs to be performing remote ID in a, in a manner that has been approved by the FAA. Um, the date that comes a year later, September 16th of next year, is the deadline for anyone flying a drone uh, to only fly a drone that is doing a remote ID unless they're in the, you know, the, the identification areas that FAA has exempted like model airplane clubs and things like that. Um, so what, do, what that means is, and I'm a little surprised that here we are, I don't know, six weeks yeah. or something yeah. out for the deadline. And I have not, <laughs> I've, I've not, seen, look, I'm not working on these things anymore. 
but I still keep an eye on them because I'm interested personally. And of course, you know, we've done a lot of work in it. It's just, I'm interested to see how things turn out, but um, there's been nothing in terms of like, like yeah. broad communication from the FAA on how to comply by September 16th. Uh, now that said, it's been known for a while that um, the FAA was, is planning to adopt and, and approve the ASTM international remote ID s standard. Uh, ASTM is a standards um, development organization. If you pick up a box of crayons, you'll see an ASTM number on, on that, that, that relates to how, you know, how do you create a crayon in a way that is non-toxic to kids if they eat them? <laughs> so like ASTM is, is everywhere in terms of creating technical standards for, for, for the safety or performance of, of various kinds of products. Uh, and it, you know, in the, in the case of the remote ID standard, uh, a bunch of industry folks uh, and other stakeholders and government have been working and they worked almost from the beginning of uh, when the rule came out to develop the actual technical standard so that the technology would be ready to comply. Um, that standard, you can go and, and obtain it yourself. It's not a secret. And uh, it's been submitted to the FAA for approval as a means of compliance. Uh, again, not working on these issues. I don't know exactly where it is. I, you know, I would have had better intel on this if I were still working on it, but my understanding is that it hasn't been fully, it hasn't been accepted yet by the FAA. That is anticipated though. Um, so again, in terms of deadlines, I, this upcoming deadline doesn't seem to me like it could possibly hold given that there's just not enough time for manufacturers to implement um, the standard that hasn't yet been approved by the FAA. Um, and so I, I would imagine, but I don't know, I would imagine there'll be some kind of extension of the deadline. So I got I got a ton of questions about all this. So uh, s standards, you talk about standards. Uh, now, the FAA publishes Part 89 of the Rule on Remote ID, which has a set of, I'm not going to call them standards, but guidelines or, or requirements that the FA wants met with this technology, then it's up to the industry to come up with standards and get them approved. And then from here, the FA issues means of compliance. Is that is that right? Uh, in the yeah, process? It's, it's a little tricky if you're not in the aviation industry, but you, you can sort of think of it as like this. The FA says, we want you to do something. We don't care how you do it, but you have to you have to sort of meet a, a, a performance standard, right? And if you look at the rule, it's like, you know, we, we needed to use an unlicensed radio to send out remote ID information. And they tell you what kind of information, its location, its serial number, uh, its emergency status. Okay, so we know what information needs to be sent. And we know it has to be sent on an unlicensed radio band so it can be re received by anyone um, and, and, and received by devices that are kind of, you know, commonly owned, which would be your, your cell phone, your tablets, that kind of thing. Um, and the reason that that's the performance requirement is the FAA wants remote ID to be widely available, just like anyone can read a car license plate. Anyone should be able to read a drone license plate. So what are the electronic radios that everyone has? Well, it's in your hand, right? It's Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's, that the FAA is not saying the, the FAA is not saying it in those words because one day, I don't know, 20 years from now, what if there's, <laughs> Let's call it pixel radio or something, right? Cool. So, <laughs> Can't so, use that name. Uh, okay, trademark. Uh, but you know, let's say there's a new radio system that's better than Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but everyone's using it, and that suddenly we want this new system. Um, great. So, so then you know, someone could come to the FA and say, "I'm doing remote ID, but I'm doing it in a different way, and it works great." And they say, "Okay, that that works too." So the the reason for this, it, it's it's the FA trying to be flexible, which is frustrating because they're also not specific. So what you need yep. is for the for someone in the industry to say, "I'm doing it. I'm doing everything you want. Here's technically how I'm doing it. Please confirm uh, for me that I'm doing what you want." And once they do that, that's the approved means of compliance. And then it, other people can do the same exact thing, knowing that someone has gone and, and gotten approval over that that means of implementing the FA's mandate. If that makes sense. So it's kind of like this back and forth yeah. two step thing. I'm, I'm glad you explained it that way. That's, it's always good because we get these questions all the time. And I, and I often struggle to try to explain, you know, these two documents because the declarations, declaration of compliance, means of compliance, standards, all these words are kind of confusing to people. So, so let's say but, tomorrow. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, you could literally go to the FA today and say, I, I figured out how to do this. 
I don't care about ASTM. I'm doing it my way. Please approve this. And, and if you are doing what, everything they want that meets the rule, they will approve your means of compliance. Now, given the way they've set up the rule that you need to be receivable by handheld devices that are commonly used, there really aren't too many options here because we know what those yeah. protocols are. Okay. But in theory, you could go to the FA with any means of compliance. And if it meets the, their uh, regulatory requirements, you would get approved. So, so do we know let's if assume anybody uh, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I, was, I was just going to finish my question. Let, let's just assume because that process is in, is important right now because we have 45 days to go before, before the manufacturers have to do this. Um, let's say tomorrow we get means of compliance approved by the FA. They're on the website. They're ASTM standards. Um, what's the next step? Can a company ABC that creates drones just take that means of compliance and say, okay, we meet the requirements. Here's our device done. Or is the FA involved again in that last process to get the declaration of compliance? So declaration is, is done by the manufacturer. And the point is not to, th this is not a certification exercise, right? The FA is not certifying that your equipment works, right? That would grind the industry to a halt. We'd, we'd all be waiting. <laughs> the Inspire 3, which I'm <laughs> not a DJI anymore. Apparently that's coming. So the Inspire 3 would sit on the shelf for like a year waiting for FA to certify that its remote ID actually does what it, what it says. Uh, that's not going to work for the drone industry. That might work for Boeing. Um, so uh, basically, it's a declaration that, you, that by the manufacturer that you are doing, that you are implementing the means of compliance the FAA has already approved. And look, the goal the goal from the FAA and everyone else has been to make this easy and, and, and possible for a wide range of manufacturers um, to implement. Uh, and we, you know, we can talk about it later. If they can't, you can also uh, add a... a add on module instead. But the, the so, goal here is widespread compliance. So as far as we know, has any drone manufacturer received the approval as of yet? And and also, uh, if anybody would have received the approval from the FAA, how would we know? Like, is there any, uh, is the FAA obliged to communicate that information to the world or no? Um, they might publish it somewhere, given the interest in it. But I, I have a feeling we'll hear about it because some company will issue a very loud press release, given that there's interest and, in, uh, you know, some sense of accomplishment. Uh, but again, like, it, it, this this is not a huge feat of anything. Like, the, this is just a matter of sending Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, or you have a choice, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth uh, information out from from a, from a radio. That's not technically hard, and it's not supposed to be hard. Yeah, but yeah, it's not mm -hmm. something you can do at home. Like you will need some engineering uh, resources if you're a manufacturer to get this. Done. But I mean, think about it. You, you've created a remote control, you know, flying robot. It's it shouldn't be difficult to also add a a uh, a short range uh, radio transmission out using off the shelf Bluetooth or Wi Fi components. Like that should not be technically hard for anyone who's making a, a a capable drone so if there is going to be an extension are there uh, specific time frames that are typically used like is something extended by six months or a year or could it be any amount of time that the fea deems appropriate yeah i, I don't think there's a standard time for this this is all kind of new stuff um so i uh, you know i look realistically they have to give time for developers to implement it so i mean that stuff doesn't happen overnight so i I'd be surprised if it was less than six months, but I also don't think the FA wants to appear to be delaying things by a year yeah. because again, you got the pressure for the security community. You've got a congressional directive. Um, at some point, they're just going to start looking bad. This already has taken way too long, right? I mean, when I talk about the 2017 ARC, it was presented as a national security emergency back then. And, you know, here we are like five years later, it's still not done. So, I don't know. I would I would guess I mean, six months to a year, but it's just a guess. The the FA is motivated, obviously, because they read through forty uh, fifty two thousand comments in in what I've been told the span of three months, and then they responded to the NPRM in a year. I mean, they they in terms of government, it, it's lightning fast. It's lightning fast if you think about it. But uh, 
it so we'll see i i'm I'm thinking yeah six months might be probably the top they want to get this done because they want to get and you know uh, bv loss done and they can't do it until they have it but anyway let's talk about remote id from a gji perspective and i'm going to blame this on you because this is the most common question that we get from students that fly dji's is well my dji has remote id now and uh and can you talk about maybe the history behind DJI and this remote identification module that they have in the app and, and what the idea was initially. And is this something that we're going to see as an easy solution to comply with remote ID in the future? Sure. So I don't work for DJI anymore and I don't speak for them, <laughs> but I do know a lot about sort of what, and I used to talk a lot about what their plans were. So, you know, with that caveat in mind, um, the goal from the very beginning of my engagement and DJI's on this was to make remote ID kind of a non-issue, right? We're, we're basically going to attach license plates to drones, but make that easy and free and cheap and, you know, hassle-free because we, you know, I and we just want people to have fun and, and continue doing productive things, whether it's for business or recreation. Um, so, the um, the benefit of, of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth um, protocols is that many drones already have the hardware on board. They're already using Wi-Fi type uh, signals to connect with the ground control station or with the phone. Um, whereas they don't have uh, on board um, LTE uh, radios and stuff like that. Uh, I guess some do, but really the consumer stuff doesn't. But almost all consumer drones are using some type of Wi-Fi variant or Bluetooth variant um, radio link for the control signal, right? So um, you can leverage that hardware to also do remote ID. The goal has always been to enable compliance through a software update. Now, not every drone out there, whether it's DJI or others, is going to be capable of being upgraded because, you know, little stuff, you know, there's quirks and also um, there'll be a question as to how far back in time DJI or any company wants to go in terms of updating their, their, their old models. Right. So, you know, is like the Phantom three going to be updated to comply. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine it would be, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but you know, um, but the goal is to make it easy and, and free to comply. And that means a software update, um, as well as making, you know, once it became clear what the path was, um, in terms of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and, and the ASTM standard, uh, made, made a lot of sense for all companies to really focus their energy on um, creating radio systems for new products that would be compatible. So I don't know, but I would imagine that in the, the DJI models that have come out in the past you know, year or two, that they ought to be easily upgradable, no problem. I would hope that other companies would have done the same thing. I know there's been a lawsuit that may have given false hope to people that they don't need to bother uh, getting ready for compliance. And maybe that has uh, unfortunately set smaller companies behind in terms of their compliance timeline. Um, but remember, the, the rule allows for add-on modules. So as long as you do that, instead, you should be able to keep flying anything uh, whenever the deadline actually comes into effect. Let me just um, add one more point to my last answer, because there was a question about, well, doesn't DJI already have remote ID? Uh, and the answer is kind of. Um, so back in 2017, it was really important, um, I thought, to show that you could perform remote ID using a broadcast technology. There was no need to connect drones to uh, an internet-based system, uh, which would be expensive and complicated just to perform a simple license plate type of function. So that was the beginning of the Aeroscope system, um, which was implemented under my direction. Uh, with kind of some of the goals of the government in mind to make drones detectable and make it possible to locate where the pilot is and to see which way the drone was going and to get the serial number. Um, so yeah, DJI yeah. drones have Aeroscope, but that was created in 2017 before the final rule or even the proposal and before the ASTM standard uh, as, as a proof of concept to show that broadcast could work. So um, to be clear, uh, that is not going to be compliant with FA remote ID because it's not the ASTM standard. It's its own system. Uh, and the receivers were not intended to be given to just anyone. The focus was on law enforcement, airports, 
uh, security agencies and, and folks like that uh, to enable solutions right then, you know, five years before the FAA deadline, when you think about it, so that some of these security concerns could start to be resolved. Um, so just so to be clear, you, you will see the remote ID information in the app and, and you've seen it there for a while, but that doesn't mean that uh, the ASTM or the FAA approved remote ID uh, solution is implemented yet. Okay, so just want to make that clear. So you mentioned the uh, the lawsuits. Um, Tyler Brennan uh, from Race Day Quads, both him, I think, in, as an individual as well as uh, as the LLC, uh, started a lawsuit against the FAA uh, about remote ID. And last Friday, uh, we learned that this was denied by the court. Um, can you explain a little bit as to what they were trying to do? I, mean, I know uh, Tyler raised, I think, around $80,000 through a uh, GoFundMe campaign. So obviously, a lot of people were on his side and felt that remote ID was not uh, the right way forward. Uh, uh, but can you talk us through the decision making of the court and where we are with that right now? On, on the uh, yeah. the Brennan RDQ case, um, uh, well, let me start by saying that um, when the proposal came out that we talked about that would mandate both network and broadcast remote ID, I think um, it was shocking. <laughs> it, it it did not follow the ARC recommendation. It would have been very invasive. I think maybe even technically infeasible. The whole you know takeoff restriction uh, problem, um, and I you know you can read DJ's comment on that. Uh, all the problems with it, um, and of course the privacy concerns. Right to, to have a government mandated database tracking all your flights and 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 having that collected by private parties who are charging you money. That sure sounds like something worth suing over, um, and so. You know, I get it. I get why there was um, a lot of um, concern and um, opposition, um, which appropriately w was channeled into the 53,000 comments submitted to the FA. But then the question was, well, is the FA going to improve this rule and make it reasonable? Because the proposal was not. Um, and really, the lawsuit should have, talk of the lawsuit should have waited until the rule was final because the proposal is just a proposal. You don't know where the agency is mm -hmm. actually going to end up. And I, I know a bunch of folks said to Tyler and, and, and his lawyers, like, this is not final yet. Let's see where we end up. Um, now, of course, the, the dilemma is that once you have the final rule, you only have 60 days to sue, right? There's a very limited window. And, and th this is an issue I encountered um, in some of my litigation early on with, <laughs> you know, the Perker and, and, um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, Texas EquiSearch cases and, and stuff like that. Uh, so you kind of have a bit of a dilemma. You you want to be ready to sue, but only on, when the rule is final, but the the window to do so is very short. So you have to have all your pieces in a row, it, it, it ready to go. Um, the, the, the concern is that like the fundraising started immediately, right? So there was already kind of like eagerness to bring the lawsuit and money being... Uh, donated to do so. Um, and so kind of the decision to sue happened before anyone saw the final rule. And, you know, you could question whether that was the smartest approach to this whole situation. But in any event, the lawsuit was brought and the, the primary argument was that the remote ID final rule, which was just brought just a local broadcast mechanism, um, was a an evasion of privacy under the Fourth Amendment, which protects people against unreasonable government searches and seizures. Okay, now in the in the typical Fourth Amendment case, you know, police enter your house without a warrant uh, and without sort of any other exceptions to the warrant requirement, and that's a violation of your Fourth Amendment rights. And the um, evidence that they may gather during that invasion gets thrown out of court if you're being prosecuted criminally. You might have some some damages or other remedies you can pursue. Um, you know, that's that's like your your kind of like typical Fourth Amendment case. In the electronic device age, the Fourth Amendment cases have been a little bit more interesting um, because there are some devices that track you everywhere you go, namely your cell phone, right? Because of how they work, they connect to the towers, they have GPS, so. There have been cases in the Supreme Court under the Fourth Amendment principles 
governing things like GPS trackers that are attached by the police to your car. Uh, and whether is that a, is that a search under the Fourth Amendment? Uh, they're not entering, but they're tracking you. Or if the police um, gather up all your cell phone location records and see where you've been for like the past several months, uh, is that a search? And the Supreme Court has said, yes, <laughs> those kinds of pervasive tracking technologies that are used in a way that gathers evidence on on person's behavior and and what they're doing throughout the day is a fourth amendment search and in the in those cases was an unlawful search because there was no warrant for those types of um searches okay so what brennan's main argument there are other arguments we can talk about in terms of the fa rulemaking process but the main argument here was requiring a remote id is an invasion of privacy of the drone pilots under the Fourth Amendment and should be struck down in its entirety because it's just it's just so invasive in any any way that it's possibly used. Okay, um, that was the main argument, and he lost. Um, he, he lost because the court, you know, the um, the D.C. Circuit, who hears um, cases, this is a panel of three judges. They hear cases uh, challenging. Um, agency rules, right? That's where you go when you have a problem with a federal agency that has done something wrong. So it kind of goes straight to a a court of appeal. You kind of skip a step, right? There isn't typical court. You get one judge, then you appeal, you get like a panel and then you appeal to the Supreme court. Okay. This is, this starts at the, at the federal court of appeals for the DC circuit. So three judges, all three of them agreed. This is not a violation of policy under the fourth amendment, uh, largely because there's, there's no privacy interest in flying a drone out in the open air. Like it's not, it's not reasonable to expect that your activity is private if you're flying a drone outside. Um, And you know that, so that's, I mean, I'll stop there because that's kind of the history of the case and the main conclusion. There's some other issues that, that surround it, but um, you know, and we can talk about whether it's surprising or not, but that's, that's kind of the gist of the case. Yeah, the Fourth Amendment discussion was pretty long in that document. Uh, read all of it over the weekend. Uh, I thought it was interesting that the FA reiterated that anything you do that's not inside your home is not covered by expectation of privacy. And, and there's a whole page where they talk about, you know, just being in your backyard behind a fence doesn't mean that you're protected by, uh, by invasion of privacy. So, uh, I thought it was a good reminder because we do get these questions a lot from, uh, non-drone users that say, Hey, somebody's flying over my backyard. It sucks. Yeah. It does, but unfortunately, it's not against the rule per se, uh, you know, to just be flying. Now there's stuff inside your house and peeping Tom Laos and all that, but uh, that's not the case here. But um, uh, there was another, I think, pretty big part, and I don't think they made it a big part of the, the lawsuit, but I think it had some uh, some pretty big implications for the industry, which was the navigable airspace section. Uh, can you maybe talk about uh, this this section? Because I think, uh, I, I mean, I had read some of your comments about this and I, and I actually ha- agreed with them uh, with the fact that this could have had some dire consequences on the industry if they had won that specific section. So can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, look, the uh, it's, it's clear the case was brought because like the, the someone had the feeling that this remote ID thing needs to be killed no matter what, and and then raised a lot of money to do that. So they the lawyers threw every argument they could think of into the case, even ar- uh, arguments that I think um, were potentially unhelpful and 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 risky. And the argument that was really risky for the drone community was this one that said the FAA does not have the authority to um, mandate remote ID um, in the lower airspace, for example, under the tree canopy um, or behind the fence in the backyard, but still in the airspace. And the, you know, this goes back to like, I mean, there have been lots and lots of policy debates in the industry with all kinds of stakeholders like the National League of Cities and the um, the state legislatures over who gets to control the lower airspace. And there've been proposals on Capitol Hill that the industry has had to lobby against and defeat that would have said 200 feet uh, and below is actually a state or local controlled airspace. And the reason for that is, you know, the, the local uh, stakeholders have said, look, drones are kind of like 
they're creepy. They're flying in our backyards. They're not like air transportation. They're more like these like, you know, selfie cameras on, on you know, they don't have a stick. Like, the, you know, local government should regulate these things when they're flying so close to property and people. Uh, and the industry has responded and said, well, if you make this arbitrary line in the sky, it's going to be chaos. What are the rules for flying? It's, it's going to be different rules in different places. What about air safety? If the local government says you can fly and the FAA says you can't like, so I, I, and we could spend an hour on, on that issue. And then, you know, lots of folks like to invoke the Cosby case, which involved the U S government flying planes over a chicken farm and scaring the chickens to, to death. And like, um, that was a that was a Fifth Amendment takings case, not really a privacy case. Although there's language in there that says you have a, you know, you may have a property interest in the immediate reaches around your property. So that's an airspace. So there's a complicated, really complicated issue. But the um, you know Brennan uh, and, and his lawyers said this is an argument for striking down the remote ID rule um, because the FAA doesn't have jurisdiction in what's essentially my private airspace. You know, if you're, if you're underneath the tree in my backyard, I I'm, that's my property. And, and therefore also it's, it's like, you know, privacy invasion, but whether or not it's privacy invasion, it's the FAA doesn't have authority because the FAA only has authority over what you said, navigable airspace, right? That's in the statute. Uh, okay. So, um, this came up in the oral argument, um, which was, you know, you could listen to the oral argument back in December. It was, um, webcast. I think the recording's still available. The judges were, I think at least two of the judges were really interested in this issue and the way it mm -hmm. sounded like it was going, you can never really, uh, predict the outcome of a case based on the oral argument. Cause often the judges are just kind of like testing stuff or, you know, um, you just don't know. But there was a lot of interest from the from two of the judges on this question of oh well how is it that the FAA can just you know sort of reach into your private airspace and and a lot of sort of hypotheticals for the lawyers including the government's lawyer um, to the extent that like I and others were quite concerned that the court might declare that yes the the, the lower airspace is private property outside of FAA jurisdiction therefore the remote, remote ID rule is invalid here's the problem with it once once you have a court saying lower airspace is, is not navigable or, or it's private property. There's no such thing as an unregulated anything in, in this country, right? Like everything is regulated. Like how, how many stories can you build in your house? Can you put in a swimming pool? Like that's your property, but the local government gets to control how and whether you get to use it the way you want. So the idea that like we were going to escape FA remote ID and then we're all going to be free to fly FPV drones underneath the canopy because we're in our own private airspace um, was like a like, like naive. Like, okay, that's a word for it because <laughs> you're walking right into state and local yeah. regulation of lower airspace. And guess, like, I lived through this for years. The local governments want to ban and limit and prohibit drone flights because of the privacy concerns and the nuisance and the creepiness. And so if that's lower airspace is not FAA jurisdiction, then it's local jurisdiction and your hobby is going to get killed. Okay. So this argument that was put in this case with the intent of killing remote ID opened up a huge Pandora's box of problems for the community. If it had been accepted and ruled on by the court as a reason to strike down the FAA remote ID rule, they didn't. Okay. So the good news is they did. They didn't actually say much about that argument. I think if you read the case carefully, you can see how they implicitly uh, rejected it because they, you know, they indicate that you know, they talk about the argument about flying underneath uh, the canopy or within the what's called the curtilage of, of your private property. And, and they basically say, look, the, the rule is only about flying in the public airspace. It op I think they say open air. Uh, and, you know, there's no privacy interest in that. And they don't say at any out, there's no indication of altitude, right? So they aren't saying, well, once you get down to 10 feet, that, that is your private property. So we would make an exception there if the rule required it. They don't. Uh, so thankfully, I, look, I don't, I don't think this issue, which is very complicated, was really appropriate to bring in front of this court on an on a, on a aircraft transponder technical requirement. I mean, when you think about it, uh, to raise this really dramatic and dangerous issue in a case that really didn't, like, there's a time and place you got to pick when you're going to make legal arguments and, and you always, you know, if you're, if your cause is to 
promote something bigger than just a case. You know, you're not just there for an academic exercise, but you care about an activity like droning or, or people who fly. Like you got to think about the bigger picture, right? You have to say, what is going to be the broader outcome here to what I'm doing in court? And do I have the right case here to make the, the right outcome for everyone? And, you know, I, I'll be the first to admit that Perker, right, was not an ideal case because the way he was flying was questionable. Um, but it was the only case that existed at the time. And he was on the defensive, right? He didn't bring that case, um, but he needed to defend it. And there was a point to be made about where are the rules? Where are the, how are we supposed to fly compliantly when you have no regulations, right? So going back to some legal history there. The next case I did, the EquiSearch case, right? Like that was an amazing case because you had volunteer search and rescue folks who were using drones to find missing kids successfully, and they were doing it safely uh, in compliance with FAA um, principles of aviation, as well as the model aircraft, the AMA rules. So that was a great case, right? Because, you know, um, you had the best situated um, case to bring. So you got to choose your battles, right? <laughs> and th this was not the right place to have the battle on uh, lower airspace private property rights. It just wasn't framed the right way. So it was very dangerous to bring it up that way without the right uh, type of framing. Uh, thankfully, the, the outcome really uh, didn't address it in any way. Uh, you could even argue the outcome was good because implicitly now, for anyone making that argument uh, in a future case, they would have to kind of look at this case and say, well, the court didn't accept that argument, kind of implicitly brushed it off and said, you know, you know, open air, you know, what's the language here? You know, there's no right of privacy in open air when you're flying a drone. That's, a, that's an indication that navigable airspace does extend to the ground and all the arguments that the industry has been making about uh, that being necessarily federal airspace, um, it, it's, it's even stronger. But, it, you know, it could have gone the other way. It would, have, it would have opened up a whole kind of worms, basically, if, uh, if it would have gone the other way. Yeah. Yeah, I what think it would, have been, it would have been a disaster. It, yeah, a total, because what, what was it? The remote, because guess what? Remote ID would be gone uh -huh. at the federal level, but it would it would take maybe you know one legislative cycle to have remote ID implemented by state legislatures exactly the same way in lower airspace. So you would have ended up at the same place on remote ID, and you'd have new state and local drone restrictions because of the jurisdictional issue. So you'd be you'd be worse off. And we've seen in the last couple of years that many cities and, and uh, states have been trying to to take ownership legally over over the uh, the airspace in their in their areas. So, yeah, uh, that would have been a disaster for sure. What was it? I think back in 2018 or 19 that the FAA uh, restated or made clear again that they uh, are the only authority for all airspace in the United States. There was a fact sheet they released. I think it was it was a while ago. I want to even say 2015. It was not very clear on this point. Um, I, so the FAA doesn't really issue like pronouncements of, of things like its own jurisdiction. Um, what they've always said is if if that were called into question in court, they would they would defend it. But um, you know they also don't lobby Congress for for what you know yeah. for their own territory. So um, I, I would say that you know. Again, I'm almost a year out of the industry now, but back then, um, the industry, broadly speaking, wanted and still wants, I'm sure they want, the FAA to say more on this issue, to make it clearer because of the, uh, the pressure to um, implement local regulations. Yeah. So going back to this, this case, what options are left for Tyler Brennan and Race Day Quads now if they decide to keep pushing this? Like, Are there options left or... How does that work? Supreme Court? Well, I, they, okay, options. They could appeal this to the Supreme Court. I mean, do they want to raise another $100,000 or more? Like, <laughs> I, this is not a, this outcome was predictable, right? I, I, the, I know early on people said, well, how come the industry or DJI aren't like behind this case? Like, because it's a losing case, right? Like, th this is not an argument. You know, the, the privacy of an aircraft in airspace, when we already have ADSB and other transponders, uh, and, and there's already a statute telling the FAA to do it. And, and you know, it's navigable airspace. So like, I mean, just this was not. You're not going to win that. So, so you could, they could appeal to the Supreme Court, but they'd be wasting everyone's money again. And I like, I don't, I don't think that serves the community, uh, but it's an option. Um, 
they could uh, help everyone comply. Like, you know, you, you could have spent the two years uh, uh, or year and a half or whatever, um, getting smaller manufacturers, assisting them in complying with the upcoming standards, getting involved in the ASTM standard, making sure it works well and, and getting ready for compliance. Um, you know, one other thing, I, you know, I should say like the, the court s dismissed the case, but only because the case was brought as to all applications of remote ID possible, which is to say, you know, Brennan wanted this struck down um, as applied in any situation, which means the court had to find that there was no way for this rule to be uh, legally valid under any circumstance. But that's kind of tough. That's a tough case. Uh, the, the door is still open in the future for any drone pilot to seek legal remedies when the remote ID rule is applied to them in a certain circumstance, right? So for example, part of the court's decision talked about, um, you know, the FAA is not collecting data in the database and making it searchable. Okay, like at some point in time, if there's really a privacy violation, um, as the rule is applied then, you know, for example, a, a criminal defendant may have their drone uh, remote ID used as evidence in court, but if that was obtained in a way that would be would violate the reasonable expectation of privacy, that issue can be raised in that case as applied then. Um, so the door isn't closed completely uh, to challenges that on circumstances that happen in the future. It's just that the rule as a whole is, is not a violation of, of reasonable expectation of privacy. And so it, it persists. And by the way, one, <laughs> one really interesting aspect of the decision that I, I noticed is several times throughout the decision, the court refers to the local nature of the of the remote ID broadcast. Um, it's like five or six or seven times. Um, you know, and at one point the court says that this is not like a, a uh, central. What's the information? I wrote this down because it was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, the local nature of remote ID makes the access to location information unlike the kind of dragnet electronic surveillance to which Brendan objects. Right. So, so interesting that as I had thought back in early 2017 in terms of remote ID solutions, that the network solution, the network mandate originally proposed could have come out very differently in this case, because yeah. that would have been a total surveillance network database collection of flight data searchable by the FAA and others in the hands of private service providers. I think that might have come out very differently and as I said yeah. a while ago, that probably would have been an outcome worth suing over um, because of how expensive and intrusive it was. But the, 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 thanks for all those comments. If you sent in your, your comment and said, please just require broadcast or give us a choice at least between the two, I, I would say you have improved the, the privacy of drone operators because the outcome is recognized by this court is not a violation of privacy. Yeah. yeah, and and the court somewhat acknowledges too that uh, the the network version would have been kind of uh, more of an issue. Do do you think that's a uh, that's killing network remote ID for any future application? What they said in there, the, the court does note that the FA abandoned it, and that it's part of the privacy discussion. Uh, I don't look. I I don't think it's gone totally. I think that the network remote ID could be and should be an option. I, I've said that. Uh, even the ARC report said, do either or. I support having a choice. Choice is good. There are benefits to a network solution. Um, uh, for example, you might have you might um, be able to better obscure your your privacy using session ID, which is contemplated by the rules. Uh, you also, um, I know a lot of people are interested in not having p the public know where you're standing fly while flying the drone in a network system, and and they, people have said. You know, can't we just make this accessible to law enforcement and FAA? Well, the problem with the broadcast is everyone, you don't know who needs to receive it in the area. So it has to be kind of an open, openly receivable solution. If you try to uh, introduce, you know, encryption keys, then there's like one key that has to unlock every, every officer's um, ability to receive the signal. As soon as that key is, is leaked, the whole thing's public anyway. So it's hard to do that with broadcast, but with a network environment, you could have access control and credentials that would limit who gets to see certain information. So I, I think there's a future for network remote ID, but that would be an opt-in voluntary system. Um, and I and I think therefore not, would not raise a privacy issue because you would be choosing to use it. Yeah. So 
on social media, uh, as soon as uh, everybody found out that this this case was uh, kicked out of court, a lot of people are like, well, once remote ID gets implemented, I'm not going to comply. I'm not going to fly according to the rules. I'm not going to comply with remote ID, which which might be tough if you buy an off-the-shelf uh, major brand drone. But if you're building your own FPV drone, it might be a different ballgame. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I think we all have an interest in in being a compliant community that is responsible. If you're flying legally and, and appropriately, you really shouldn't have anything to hide. You know, why, why aren't those folks taking the license plate off their car, right? I mean, um, so, you know, on one level, um, compliance shouldn't be a big deal unless you're doing something wrong. Um, on the other hand, yeah, I, you know, I get it. Every, every, group has people who don't want to comply with the law. I remember when registration came out, it was the same thing. I'm, I'm not going to put this number on my plane or drone. Uh, I get it. Um, you know, just remember in social media, the, the most, uh, the most vocal, uh, fired up people tend to be the ones who post a lot, uh, and, and post the loudest. So that doesn't mean that you, uh, are seeing a, a real sample of what the community is, is doing. Uh, I think compliance will be, pretty broad because it's easy and free and it's going to be built in and you can do it with a software update in many cases. Okay. So, and that's the point. And I think, you know, here's the problem. Like if, if we don't get broad compliance and then there's some incident and the government concludes that, you know, dr like drones just can't be secure when flown by, you know, ordinary people, then the, the restrictions on purchase and, and flight will be curtailed. So we have an interest in protecting what matters, which is the access to the technology and your freedom to fly. And the, the price of that is being accountable and responsible um, through identity, just like your license plate on the car. And I, I think, you know, in the long run, it's, it's going to be important that the community as a whole is compliant. And I hope people change their mind. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I was also looking at the clock. I see we're running out of time, but I think that's uh, that's a very good point to end this show on. The fact that uh, to protect our freedom to fly, uh, following the rules and complying with remote ID uh, is the, the smart way to go. Uh, Brendan, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, sharing your thoughts and your opinion and uh, all your experience in the drone industry on uh, on remote ID. It's, uh, it's much appreciated. Oh, thanks for having me. It was fun. 